Uganda has passed one of the strictest anti-homosexuality laws on the planet. If you perform a sexual act with a person of the same sex, then you have committed the offense of homosexuality. And what is the punishment? Imprisonment for life. It has also carved out a new crime called aggravated homosexuality. If minors are involved or if a disease like HIV is transmitted, the maximum penalty is death. This is bad news. It's not just for queer Ugandans, but for queer people across the African continent. Promoting homosexuality, 20 years in prison. Attempted homosexuality, 10 years, and the list goes on. But Uganda has put itself in a very precarious position. It is intensely reliant on foreign aid. Its people need it to survive. And Western countries have condemned Uganda's harsh new direction. We have grave concerns with the passage of the Anti-Homosexuality Act. Human rights are universal. No one should be attacked, imprisoned, or killed simply because of who they are or whom they love. So why would the Ugandan government stoke this fire? Why would it risk so much to fight this fight? If they interfere with our trade, we shall trade with others. I said, you people you, you, you should be ready for a war. Locally here, many Ugandans are excited about the president's decision, signing it into law, because it has been a big debate on the streets. One thing to understand is that when it comes to gay rights, Uganda is not like Canada. The majority of Ugandans are, yes, religious, very religious, Christian, Pentecostal, and then Muslim. So for once, you have like the major religious groups behind this. So there's really local support. That's Nicholas Barrio. He's a reporter with The Wall Street Journal based in Kampala, Uganda. There have been a lot of fear-arousing techniques and uh, adopted by these religious groups telling the population you're about to be extinct or the West is trying to impose their values, they are threatening their family, things like that. So there is a lot of uh, support for the law. And that's actually true of most of Africa. More than half of countries there have laws against homosexuality. This issue of homosexuality is a very serious issue because it is an issue of the human race. It's not genetic, it's not hormonal, it is psychological disorientation where somebody, because of some experience, hates the people he should love and loves the people he should not love. It's a type of like a sickness. That's Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni. He's ex-military, and he does what he wants. He toppled the government in 1986 and has ruled Uganda ever since. Ironically, he was early on celebrated by the Western world, seen as part of a new generation of African leaders. But a lot's changed almost 40 years later. In 2014, when the government last tried to pass a less restrictive version of this law that we're talking about today, there were consequences. Western governments suspended aid, imposed restrictions on Ugandan officials, curtailed security cooperation, and though the country's leaders were defiant, the law was ultimately struck down on a procedural point, but those sanctions stung. I think most of the politicians are a bit conflicted, yes, at one hand. Uh, on one hand, they really enjoy these ties, but then at some point they also think they should hold their ground and uh, push back against what they perceive as Western imperialism. There is even a prevailing view that homosexuality itself is imported from abroad. The problem with the Europeans is that they, they, they bring things which are out of place. This is, of course, false. People were gay in Uganda long before colonial times. But it also goes without saying, in 2023, if you are gay in Uganda, even if you're not thrown in jail, life has been undeniably difficult for you. Homelessness has been a real issue for the community, and we're seeing that on the rise because evictions are happening, um, uh, family banishment is happening, people being kicked out of churches, 
jobs, schools. There's no hope, but where are we supposed to go? You don't want us in your country. You're not giving us jobs. You're not giving us education. You're not giving us medication. You are criminalizing people renting to us. Where do you want us to go? You are arresting us for literally doing nothing, for simply existing, you know? But where are we supposed to go? How did we become refugees in our own countries? Uganda's bill was signed into law with nearly unanimous political support. Protests have been small. There are activists who vow to fight the law in court. But for the rest of the public, the majority think this is good for the country. So what does the world intend to do? Well, there was this veiled threat from US President Joe Biden that this move jeopardizes the prospects of critical economic growth for the entire country. What he's doing there is taking a page from the U.S. playbook in 2014, when foreign aid to Uganda was cut. The U.S. government undertook an internal review of its relationship with Uganda. The conclusion is a series of steps, including pulling $2.4 million in annual funding for community policing projects and reallocating funds away from the Ugandan Ministry of Health towards non-governmental organizations. According to the State Department, the U.S. sends Uganda almost a billion dollars every year. There is a big concern. Uganda depends heavily on donor aid for its HIV AIDS programs. For its, not just HIV, but we're talking about tuberculosis. We're talking about the number one killer, malaria. And three of the world's leading health campaign groups, PEPFAR, UNAIDS, and the Global Fund, they issued a joint statement saying they were deeply concerned about the harmful impact of the legislation. Now, these groups say the stigma and discrimination associated with Uganda's new laws have made it that much harder for people living with HIV to seek treatment at all. The fear is that most of these people, some of them who are on antiviral treatments, are actually going underground, or those who get into trouble or would want to know their HIV status can't come out because they actually learn the risk of being arrested and prosecuted. A couple of weeks ago, the U.S. threatened possible sanctions for those involved in carrying out human rights abuses in Uganda. The Speaker of Uganda's parliament, who supported the passage of the bill, had her American visa revoked. And Joe Biden has also told his National Security Council to consider how this might affect U.S.-Uganda relations. The U.K. government chimed in too, saying it was appalled and that the law would, quote, increase the risk of violence, discrimination, and persecution, will set back the fight against HIV AIDS, and will damage Uganda's international reputation. Take away my sexuality and I'm still an African. So what is it about me? That makes me un African so much so that you need to legislate laws to criminalize me. Criminalize me for what? For being who I am? When do you criminalize you for being who you are? Now, we have yet to see what real teeth the West has in this matter, just how far it's willing to go to punish Uganda for its views. But what is clear is that Ugandan lawmakers believe they are on the right side of history and that if the West won't join them, there are others who will. Uganda is going to get closer to countries like Russia, not mentioning the fact that Uganda has one of the longest serving presidents. And these are some of the values that uh, a country like Russia will like, like and support. There are two ways of life, the normal and the abnormal. And then you put it there. If, if there is an abnormality, why don't you seek to treat the One last thing we should say about this. Yoweri Museveni scrapped presidential age limits about five years ago, paving the way for him to continue to rule for a long time to come. And if he ever does step down, word is his son is ready to take his place. <laughs>